as we welcome you back to the second edition of Hill Center Stage, a really unique conversation series created by the divine and witty Rebecca Shear. We welcome her guest, uh, Peter Marks. He joined the Washington Post as its chief theater critic in 2002. Prior to that, he spent nine years at the New York Times, where he kind of did everything theater critic, reporter on culture, national and metropolitan desks. He's a prolific journalist. He's a professor. He teaches uh, theater criticism at GW. But I love the fact that he served three times as chairman of the drama jury for the Pulitzer Prize. So we're just sort of basking in that reflected glory. <laughs> Rebecca Shear is the host and producer of Metro Connection on WAMU 88.5. Her work is aired on all of the stellar programs that we love on National Public Radio, All Things Considered, Marketplace, The Splendid Table, Latino, or Latino USA, Only a Game, Here and Now, Interfaith Voices, Voice of America, Chicago Public Radio, and many other public radio stations. So it's a real thrill to have you back, and welcome to both of you. So before we talk about your current gig, um, when we invited you to come here tonight, you and I corresponded a little bit over email, mm -hmm. and I asked if there are any lesser known things about you that maybe we could talk about. And you said yes, you have one, run with the bulls, two, luged, <clears throat> and three, hung out in Barbara Streisand's living room, all for pay. <laughs> <laughs> so how about you just Pick one of those and tell us the story behind it. Well, I'll tell you the most terrifying one, which was sitting in Barbara Streisand's <laughs> living room. Uh, I, was, I was assigned when she was the um, Kennedy Center honoree to, to, uh, to go out to Malibu and, uh, and spend time with her, which was uh, terrifying to me. It was daunting and terrifying. I admired her greatly and also knew she had this uh, reputation for being uh, tremendously demanding and dictatorial as a director, and I imagined in, a, in an interview it might be the same kind of thing. And the most extraordinary part of the event really was the uh, the lead up to um, the interview, getting the tour of her um, her her compound. She has designed, uh, being a completely um, anal compulsive person, uh, uh, a series of houses, each of which is different from the others and each in a style of, of design of her uh, that she's studied. I mean, she is um, incredibly uh, 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 pre precise about des the design elements of her ho houses. Anyway, I went through one of the houses and every room in the house was designed after a different designer, Stickley, arts and crafts. I mean, every room had a different theme. And then they took me into the basement of her newest house, which was under her specifications, the recreation of an old English street. <laughs> and there was a little cobblestone street in the basement, and each room in the basement, was, they were divided into shops. There was a candy shop with a real taffy-making machine. Yeah, I mean, it was mind-boggling. I just, I couldn't, you know, by the time I met her, I was, I was like in shock myself. It was astonishing. So that was a truly harrowing experience. But of course, talking to her was a great, a great opportunity. And one of those things you get to do when you do the kind of work we do. So let's go to your current gig. I know that you didn't go straight to being a theater critic, but in terms of, of reviewing plays professionally, was it ever the kind of thing where in third grade it was come to school dressed as what you want to be when you grow up day and you came dressed as like Kenneth Tynan? Did you ever, <laughs> did you ever think when you were younger you'd end up reviewing plays? Does everyone know who Kenneth oh, Tynan is? Oh, did everyone get that reference? Okay. Uh, no, totally not. And, and I had no desire to be a critic, it never crossed my mind until the day, and that's the God's honest truth, until the day an editor at the New York Times asked me if I wanted to be a critic. That was how it, it, it evolved. I loved the theater. I thought I might be an actor when I was an undergraduate. I acted in all kinds of plays, and I thought maybe uh, that would be the route for me. Um, and I basically, when I was leaving college, I applied to newspapers and to a uh, to an acting school in New York, and I got a job at a paper before I heard from the acting school, so I became a reporter. That's basically how it happened, and it was totally accidental that I became a theater critic. Totally. What was the first show you reviewed? 
the, the first, well, the first show I reviewed was an incomprehensible play by Penn Gillette, who is the half of the Penn and Teller team, and it was a, it was, it was a nasty uh, piece of uh, scabrous, uh, bloody uh, uh, um, uh, mayhem, and I remember panning it. That was the first thing I did as a critic. I, was that I, a direct quote that you just used there? The I don't scabrous. think so. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I'm just remembering it being a terrible play. And, and that was sort of my introduction to, to reviewing. And it was overnight I had to become uh, an authoritative voice in the New York Times, which was a crazy absurd idea to uh, to make someone do that um, with basically only a love of theater and having covered it as a reporter as a background um, so uh, that was the the first thing I did yeah and very quickly you know reviewed you know hundreds and hundreds of other plays um, all over the place what you just did there that the, the scabrous medley of mayhem whatever yeah. um, you are quite the wordsmith, I have to say. You have quite the reputation, and in another interview, you referred to adjectives as a critic's best friend and worst enemy. And you've also said that you live in terror that you'll quote yourself. Is it true that you use a special software program to prevent repeating <laughs> yourself? No. I heard, no? No. no. That would be great. I, I wish there was a, it was true. I wish that existed. <laughs> I mean, this is a wonderful myth. I can't believe, first of all, I can't believe there are myths about how I would possibly, you know, write a review. And secondly, no, there is no software in which you can check. What you can do is you can go on Nexus or some other database with your stories in them, and you can type in a word and find out when the last time you used that adjective. I mean, you, you, there is this idea, if you think about it, uh, how many how many words of praise or derision can you can can one person really have in their in their arsenal without overusing them? I mean, we astonishing, dazzling. I mean, all those words we hear, you know, they become sort of all become cliches at one le level or another when you when you're uh, reviewing. Uh, uh, the uh, former restaurant critic for the New York Times told me that he was told by uh, by chefs that the instantly the most popular um, item, food item on any menu is when you use the adjective crispy. People <laughs> love crispy things. So he would, <laughs> so in his reviews, he would always, when he wanted to flag the best dish or something, he'd always say it had a crispness or it, you know, some, some other form of crisp because that was the, that's the way it, it, uh, it, it played with people. And, and you learn what, what adjectives are triggers in a review. I mean, you, you do learn over time uh, that uh, you, you, have to, uh, you have to commit in a review to a point of view. You can't just be equivocal and say on the one hand on the other. And there are adjectives that immediately uh, convey uh, a, a point of view and 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 give you that that entree into a either a positive or negative review but no there is no software there is no way i know to <laughs> to, to to police adjectives but i bet there could be an app for that i i would buy it in an instant <laughs> are there certain words you've had to retire because you feel like it's just too much too cliched at this point oh hundreds i mean it's you know it's yeah i mean it's the hardest part of being a reviewer and anybody uh, who does that? There are a couple of other people I know who write about the theater in the room. Uh, you 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 learn that um, for us. I mean, you know, it becomes there is a, a a repetition of of terminology that you worry that people are going to like, you know, call you up and say, "Would you stop using the word astounding? I can't read it again." <laughs> and it really wasn't astounding. You know, to you it might have been, but to nobody else was it. Well, given your, your knack for language and, and not repeating yourself, I want to play a little game that I'm going to call Name That Review. Oh, God. So I, I have um, just a selection of excerpts, okay. and the names have been removed as in actors, directors, playwrights. But let's see if you can remember which play <laughs> you were reviewing. Right. This first one I think might be too easy, but, and don't give him any hints. Are they from the last couple of years, at least? I mean, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. all right. I feel like I'm on NPR. It's like a game <laughs> show. You know? And feel free to stop me with this okay. first one. Exactly. All right. Okay. The other night while at a play, a woman in a crafty way came up to me and with some cheek suggested for my next critique a novel voice in which to chime. Could I, she asked, review in rhyme? Uh, that was a David Ives play, uh, not The Liar, it was the other one. What was it? Yeah, the one. 
the one before? It was in September 2011. Well, that doesn't help, but I mean, it was, um, what was it? It was a, uh, yes, it, not the, um, I'm, 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 I'm blanking, but I'm close. It's it was on Shakespeare, the tip of your brain Shakespeare right now. Theater Company. Yes. Uh, not the liar by David. It was David Ives of a not a Cornet play, but of um, so another obscure French playwright. Should I just tell you? Yes. The heir apparent. The heir apparent. I was going to say the heiress, but that would have been totally wrong. <laughs> Sorry. How in the world did you get away with writing a review in uh, rhyme? Um, uh, well, the uh, the editor of the paper. That was the only time I've ever done that, and it was uh, the reason I did it was. Uh, I, I was challenged on the way out of the theater by someone who said, I dare you to write a review in rhyme. And I was told <laughs> that the editor of the paper uh, at the time, Marcus Broccoli, was highly skeptical that he should even uh, 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 entertain the idea of it. But after he read it, he thought it was funny. So that was the, uh, 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 you know, after you've written 2,000 reviews, you're looking to entertain yourself. I did, <laughs> I did get um, a letter from someone. I got many you know, obviously people love a scanned language that verse that really works. But I did get a, um, a letter from, a, from a, a reader who said, you know, you really didn't do justice to the production. You did it to your, you know, you really were having fun yourself. I'm not sure you helped anybody who wanted to go see the play. And I just wrote back, oh, please. I mean, I, was, I wasn't going to, you know, I mean, I do think, you know, at some point we all have to have a sense of humor about this. It's not at some level, what a critic does or what a writer does is try to entertain. You know, you want the audience to enjoy the writing. And I, that's why I don't do it every week. I don't rhyme every week. But I thought in that case, it was a rhymed couplet play seemed to deserve a rhymed couplet review. And here's the next one. Oh, God. And this is just anything you've written in the past few years. Hint, it's not necessarily local, local, local. Mm hmm but maybe it is. Okay. Clearly though, the Department of Lucidity has not been in the building in quite a while. Story-wise, name of play, is a shrill, insipid mess, a musical aimed squarely at a Cub Scout demographic. Looking at the sad results, you're compelled to wonder, where did all those tens of millions go? The eight-year-old boys in the audience might be able to key on the Cirque du Soleil style stunts on wires and video game graphic elements, and probably not worry too much that, name of show, is a tangle of disjointed concepts, scenes, and musical sequences that suggests its more appropriate home would be off a highway in Orlando. <laughs> You know, this is stumping me. I, I feel really embarrassed. Uh, it could be any one of five shows. I, think. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, Cirque du Soleil, stunts, people on wires, little boys, video game. Isn't this terrible? I don't remember. I think I need a doctor. I, I'm not, you know, I don't really. Do you want to call a friend or what's it called? Lifeline? Far, Landline? Um, uh, I don't know. Spider-Man, turn off the Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, that, was, that, <laughs> that was terrible, that show. <laughs> that was terrible. You see, but it's like you write... I, <laughs> I've, been, I've been doing this for so long. I'm 58 years old. And uh, the, uh, the memory banks sort of start to uh, evaporate. But that's, that's a good, that was actually a good, some good lines in that right? one. Right? Yeah. yeah. Ouch. Um, well, one more, which okay. um, shows your, your knack for... Um, sort of metaphors, figurative language, extended metaphors. But there are a lot of blanks in here, so it might get confusing. But anyway, let's do this. With a buoyant air and a bouquet of ripe performances, Blank Theater further expands Washington's classical borders with name of play. A send up of 18th century social probity by the restoration comedy playwright. Oh. Name doesn't ring a bell? Nope, not with me either. That's partly why this piquant dish, mounted with considerable aplomb by director, hmm, and dressed to the sensational nines by costume designer, hmm, comes with a side of pleasant discovery. <laughs> this no is idea. really awful. I don't know. I, I mean, I know it's Shakespeare Theater Company. I, 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 it could be any one of like, it's not the Silent Woman by Ben Johnson. It's 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 not the Rivals because that was because Richard, Richard Brinsley Sheridan was better known. It wasn't. Uh, uh, I don't. I'm sorry. Does I anyone recognize it? Anyone? The gaming table. The gaming table. <laughs> and it was at the Folger too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, they actually did do some. They've done some French 
comedy um, uh, intermittently, but much less um, routinely than Shakespeare has. The Shakespeare Theater Company has. Okay, I'm totally humiliated. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, let's go back to questions I know you can answer. That was like the not my job portion of wait, wait, don't tell me. <laughs> Although it is your job. Anyway. I, um, I missed all three. <laughs> so let's go back to you as a theater critic and the thousands of plays you've written. And I want to talk now about the power, perce perceived or, or actual power right. that you have. Right. Um, for instance, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. The paper was The Plain Dealer. And without fail, anytime anything was reviewed, be it a restaurant, a play, or a movie, my grandmother would say, well, they said it's good. Or they thought it was terrible, so therefore it must be they. As in, the person who wrote the review, it was they. How do you feel that there, you, you are thought of in that sort of omnipotent, omniscient way? You are they. Uh, you, first of all, I don't think that exists particularly strongly anymore. I think that that has, in, in, this, um, in, in this new age of, of everyone's a critic, essentially, which really always existed, it's just that people just didn't have a computer to, to, to be able to spread their own voices. Uh, I, I am I'm a denier of, of the power of the critic. I can't, first of all, I can't function thinking that, uh, that this job can make or break a production. It's it, first of all, it's not a healthy way to live as a as a human being if you have a conscience. And secondly, I'm not so sure it's true anymore. The 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 the, the reach of of a, a modern um, outlet uh, in the modern age of an outlet like the Washington Post, perhaps is more limited. Certainly, its circulation is more limited. Its reach online may be larger, but ultimately, um, I think that uh, that that the level of of skepticism about what mainstream media s says and what any one voice professes in this day and age is more limited. I don't think people necessarily trust a, a single voice, and I think that's a good thing. I don't, certainly, and I never did before I did this job. And I am astonished at the variety of um, um, expectations and preconceptions that people have in reading reviews, what they bring to the process and is, is so different, each person, their own experience and how much time they've actually spent thinking and reading and talking about plays themselves probably factors in there. But I, I find that, you know, to generalize and to say, you know, the critic has tremendous power, the critic can make or break a play, has less and less validity. Um, because you have other options for figuring out what you think. And I think, I think there's, a, as I said, a higher level of skepticism about what comes at you from these previously um, you know, uh, uh, lofty organizations that I think have been sort of humanized and brought down to sort of, and are humbled in a way. Uh, so that, so I can't, I, I can't say to you I, you know, I, 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 and I, and I, and because I don't really believe that the power of the critic should be to make or break a production, it really should be to start a conversation, and you can say he's an idiot or he's very smart or or she's uh, a wonderful writer and she really helped me understand any of those things. Those are useful ways to talk about criticism. I think it's less useful to talk about them as, as the um, as the sword that 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 comes down and decides whether or not a production is going to be attended or not. Although wasn't it sort of mentioned or implied last week at the summit, which we'll talk about in a moment, and we'll talk about what that is and sort of what happened, um, wasn't it kind of implied by one of the artistic directors that a great review from the Post might lead them to perhaps raise ticket prices? Yes, they, they, but it's all, it's, these are myths that, that, that theaters help to create. When a, when a review is good, they want to sell your review, they want everyone to hear your words, and, and it's all about selling tickets. When your review is not good, they want to say, you're in, you know, this review has absolutely no impact, our audiences love us, not him or her, and therefore it's meaningless. So, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game that gets played in each situation, not unlike any other walk of life. Um, you, you, you find these same things. Uh, uh, discussions going on around, you know, po in politics, in other uh, uh, art forms, in business. I mean, it all depends on which voice and and who's celebrating versus who's say who's um, who's dissenting. So I, um, 
you know, so that's, the, that's how I, I look at that. Um. Let's talk about the summit, shall we? Um, for those of you who might not be aware, there was an event last week at Arena Stage um, on Monday night, the first of a series that Peter is going to be um, moderating, talking about um, the state of theater, um, DC theater. And um, I guess, um, do you want to sort of tell us who your guests were last week and what you were intending to talk about? And then the firestorm that kind of ensued in the uh, Twitter sphere. Well, I'll just tell you that, that first of all, Molly Smith, the uh, artistic director of Arena Stage, did something extraordinary, I, it, it, something that's never happened to me in in 20 years of on and off being a, a critic. She invited me into her theater. She cast me in the role of a moderator and asked me to curate a series of evenings of my own imagining, uh, any any way I wanted to, uh, of panels of people to talk about the American theater. And <clears throat> I was at first a little uh, worry just because I didn't want to be co-opted. I didn't want to be perceived as part of this organization and doing their bidding. On the other hand, we're in a changing world. We're in a world of, you know, where the relationships are much more, uh, we're much more interconnected. And I thought this is a wonderful opportunity to get people talking about maybe aspects of the theater that they don't get to hear that much. I mean, we we're, we're, panel discussions are done to death. I mean, we, uh, we have, you know, We've all been to too many panel discussions, and I didn't want it to be necessarily just another panel discussion. Anyway, I devised three evenings, one of them um, consisting of, excuse me, of artistic directors, Washington artistic directors. The second one is, that one occurred last week. The second one uh, is going to be th actors, uh, just of, of Washington actors, and the third one is going to be because I only got three, I had to smush the playwrights and directors together in the third one. So it'll be playwrights and directors. It's going to be an unwieldy sized p panel. But I wanted to get those groups together. And I decided it should really be Washington artists talking about Washington theater. A, because Washington theater has evolved into something that's worth talking about. Not that it wasn't before, but it's, some, but it's, something, it's something unto itself, a very powerful artistic force, I think, and gaining strength, and needed, and I think audiences and, and artists in the theater need to be able to talk to each other a little bit more than they do. And that was sort of my, that was really my, my objective. And what happened last Monday night, to my utter astonishment, was that, and I purposely did not put it online as a live streamed event, some you know, live streaming, you all know, meaning it would go out on the internet. I thought selfishly because I wanted the seats to be filled. I didn't want people sitting at home and watching and my being up there with five artistic directors and 11 people in the audience, which I thought would happen. And secondly, I thought also it was a conversation for Washington. It wasn't for Denver and Cleveland and, and Miami at that point. Anyway, uh, what happened was there were, uh, Questions I asked and answers that were given by the five artistic directors, Molly Smith, Paul Tatro of Ford's Theater, Ryan Roulette from Roundhouse Theater, Eric Schaefer from Signature Theater, and Pata Tsikorshvili from Synetic Theater, uh, were tweeted out to the world. And a couple of the questions I asked, which were not, I really didn't um, mean them to be um, intensely provocative. I just thought they were questions that would be interesting to the room. Uh, caused a sensation, a mini sensation, in the theater world. Uh, and I heard about it from more than just Washington people, I heard it from all over the country. And one of the questions that became most uh, inflammatory and the answers to it uh, was a question about women. Because I asked the question, which is really precipitated by an event that's happening in Washington in the fall of 2015, which is uh, the commissioning of 50 women uh, who are going to do new plays at 50 theater companies across the city, which is probably an unprecedented event in terms of scale. The, 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 the part of it that's wonderful is, A, that there are 50 theater companies that could commission plays in Washington and, and want to do them. The, the slightly concerning aspect is that we're in the year 2014, and we feel we have to showcase a group of people called women uh, to show what they can do as playwrights, which, and it's even more 
um, uh, uh, dis dis um, disconcerting in a way because it turns out statistically women comprise bet about two thirds of the audiences for theater. They are the ticket buyers. They are the seat fill. They are the people who go, and the and and. Uh, theater companies across the country, from Broadway to San Francisco, about something between 17 and 20 percent of plays are written by women that get produced. Something's wrong. I mean, and something is odd. And now I, I, I've gotten feedback from people who say, I don't care who writes the play. I just want a good play. But there's something more to it than that. There's something, there's something odd to me about, I, I asked the question, are women theater goers the most depressed majority in, in the world? You know, they're not hearing their own stories, not that they don't want to hear men's stories, but why aren't they hearing stories told by women? And the responses from the, th the, the, the artistic directors reflected to me the fact that they are not as engaged in this dialogue as I am because I'm online all the time. It was really also inspired by having been on social media, I tweet like crazy with people in the theater world, that I understood that this was an issue. And they didn't. They, didn't, they weren't quite as tuned in and they were more tuned in, I think, to what they're used to saying to uh, defensively to their boards perhaps, or maybe even worrying about other issues, including how they're gonna fill seats and how they're gonna sell 400 tickets a night in their theater, that kind of thing. So that was, uh, that's a long way of saying that this became a bigger thing than I thought it was going to be. And I'm now being asked to do other summit, that I called these things the summit. Now, small theater companies in Washington want their summit. Yeah, everyone wants a summit now. <laughs> so so it's, that's a wonderful thing. I mean, the fact that passions can get, get this inflamed over theater says to me that this is, this is a thing that's alive and people want to claim it as theirs. And artists, young artists particularly, are angry because they feel like they're not getting access uh, the way they feel like they thought they would. And all these things are, I think, these, th we, 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 we got at something real. That's all I'll say. It, it was a panel discussion that started as something that was not going to be a, necessarily something uh, exciting, and I think it became something exciting. So has that then influenced you in terms of how you'll be handling the next two? Absolutely. But I don't want it to be, I, I, I'm going to ask, it, it's easy, listen, it's easy in a group of with artistic directors who are basically weirdly insulated to some degree from audiences. You don't hear a lot. I don't know how many of you are subscribers to a theater in Washington on a regular basis or go to the theater at a certain place on a regular basis, even if you're not subscribers. Yeah, I mean, these are, your, these are the leaders, these are the people determining what we're seeing, and I, they're not necessarily used to answering, except at the box office and at the board meeting, to what, and maybe, and in reviews, well, that actually is a lot of places, but um, they're not maybe hearing all the time from, from the people who are going, so, so that was, um, that was part of the, 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 the what, what would surprise me. And yes, it will, it will encourage me now to ask the actors, for example, uh, about um, their sense of this shrinking world. Because the other statistic I, I threw out was that theater is, is, is the most, possibly the most endangered in terms of audience growth of all the uh, performing arts. Uh, not so much in terms of total numbers, but over the last, but between 2008 and 2012, for example, the NEA did a study and showed that um, nationally, theater audiences for straight plays had declined by 9%. Um, for musicals in that same, I'm sorry, um, musicals by 9%, for straight plays in that same period, those over those four years by 12% had shrunk. And over the last decade, the number of People who say they went to the theater for a straight play had shrunk by 33%. So I'm going to talk even to actors about, I'm going to ask them some of these same questions I asked the artistic directors and see if I get a different response. You wear a lot of different hats and now you're taking on this new one of, of I don't know, sort of analyzing and being the voice of, of mm, just asking the questions that need to be asked. Um, and another hat that you wear sometimes is that of teacher. Um, you've taught theater criticism at GW. Mm -hmm. Are there other places around town, or is that the main? No, I've done it at GW. Yeah. Um, so I did a little more internet research, 
and uh, ratemyprofessor.com. <laughs> oh, dear. This is <laughs> terrible. Your students appear to love you. Oh, good. Thank um, God. Here, here are a few. Um, a lot of these are in all capital letters, which I'll try to signify with my voice or hand or something. I loved Professor Marx. He's the perfect person to be teaching a theater review class, a highly respected critic in the DC theater scene, but also the most down-to-earth, hilarious, friendly guy. It's Read great. on. <laughs> Another student. It's great to hear his professional opinion, as well as a well-respected critic, and get a sense of the theater world outside of academia. He's the man. <laughs> Take his course. I love this man. He's hilarious and amazing. God bless Peter Marx. <laughs> but so one bad. student writes, P.S., the papers are hard to write and aren't graded easily. Don't freak out too much about the grading. It works out in the end. A couple of students sort of had that same sentiment that you are one tough grader. Are you reviewing their papers? <laughs> well, you know, you're, I'm a teacher. And that, you know, it actually, what's interesting is that, that being a teacher gave me a new insight into being a critic because, you know, teachers are critics. They're assigning grades, for God's sakes. They're, they're affecting the, the futures of their students. Uh, they're, 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 they're assigning a value to what they have experienced of their work. It's, it's not unlike, and yet, but the interesting thing is that people hate critics, but not teachers. I mean, it's like why, you know, why I was, I'm embraced for some of the same things I'm vilified for when you don't like a professional person whose play or performance you've seen. So, so it's an interesting, uh, it, it, it's been an interesting experience. And I will say that, you know, there are some students who don't, like me as much. I mean, those are very nice. I've had you know evaluations where a couple of students thought I, I mean, they tended to be the minority, but they still said that they didn't like uh, some of the things I said, or if I talked, you know, they, they were you know they they weren't as enamored as these those lovely reviews that you just read. But uh, the other thing I was going to say was, you know what, we, we talk you know we talk in the theater a lot about the need to get the next generation energized uh, to see theater. And what I found in taking young people, 18, 19 year olds, many of them not theater lovers when they started the course, uh, it was both honor students I had classes and in the theater department. When I took the honor students, many of them were med, med you know, pre-med and pre-law, and they just wanted a different kind of experience. And what I found was when they'd go to the theater, they would feel extremely uh, unwelcome that they would feel like they came and it was like they were like the sharks in West Side Story. They were, you know, and like the, the rest of the audience would recoil at the sight of 15 young people. That's how they experienced it to some degree. Some of them, I mean, ultimately, that's not how they experienced it. But, but to some degree, they felt like it was not their space. And what I learned from this experience is that, that over the course of a semester, when you take students to young people to, fifth, to 10 shows, and you mentor them that way. You really hold their hands, bring them in, show them this world can be for them. It makes it a safe place for them. And they want to come back. And they want to they wanna feel like they're authorities on it like everybody else does who sees a play. And that's a wonderful transformation. It's just that it's very labor intensive. To get that done, you have to really do it almost one-on-one. -on -one. And it's almost our responsibility as grown-ups, I think, as theater-loving grown-ups, to do that, it, it's, it's exhausting. It exhausted me. It wiped me out. Um, you know, on top of that, on top, and, and reviewing on top of that was, was, was hard, and grading all those papers. But it, it, it really is the way to, to get that generation going. Because as I said, the numbers are shrinking. The theater is not replacing, it's not replenishing its audience with 22-year-olds as the older people who love theater, like myself, um, start to age out, uh, we're, not, we're not bringing in that next generation with the kind of vigor that needs to happen. So in terms of the theaters themselves attracting young people, whose job is it? Is it the content that they choose to produce? Is it the marketing department? Who at the theater can target these kids and get them in the seats? Playwrights. It's the plays that it's writers. It's the it's the writers and the directors both. Those people can get if the topics interest 
people, if they're done in a dynamic way, they don't have to, I don't think it has to be, it's not a marketing decision. I'm not even sure it's a price point. I do think some of it is, yes, it's gotta be cheap enough so that young people feel like it's an option. But I think it's gotta be material that really speaks to uh, a wide range of people. You know, we have raised a young generation to think, I have a 22 year old daughter, a 21 year old daughter, and I know I'm guilty of this. We've made them think the world is about them. In a way, I didn't find that when I was 21. I thought I had to discover the world that was created out there and I had to find my place in it. I think we've made it for a lot of young people, a world that we think, they think we, we're going to sort of open it up for them and, and, and make it work for them. I, I know this just, maybe I'm generalizing from personal experience, but that translates to some degree, I think, to theater. Uh, they expect it to come to them. And that's why sometimes smaller companies and smaller spaces are doing better with younger people. They feel they want that, they want that connection. Um, I'm not an expert on this subject, but I do feel like some of these things probably are true. And I don't think, I do think that the more we invite younger playwrights to work with in these spaces and younger directors to figure out what what this a variety of audiences will will will, will experience, I th I think maybe you know will will interest more younger people and come to come in to join to come into the tent. So when you're not teaching, when you're not reviewing, when you're not sitting in a theater seat, what do you do to just decompress? Do you watch a lot of just bad TV? Like what do you do to sort of just kick back? That's a great question, and I I watch a lot of good TV. I'm right, I'm in the middle of House of Cards at the moment, which I can't stop watching. And I see, by the way, I see a lot of DC actors on House of Cards, which is kind of gratifying. Um, I, I find that a lot of really good writing, and you know what, I've talked actually to um, people in Hollywood about this, they love hiring playwrights to write these shows. And if you notice, Bo Willimon, for example, who's the creator of House of Cards, is an off-Broadway playwright. I mean, he, he worked on The Hill, I think, actually, and, and, and wrote a couple of plays that got decent reviews and you know is now he's still writing plays actually but he's but that's what that's the that's the tr the transition many many uh, 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 playwrights make and, and and the TV is good the TV is as good as I've ever seen it in my adult life so I do that how do I decompress uh, you know like everybody we, you know you, what, what do you do to decompress Rebecca I mean I you know I, I I don't go to more plays to decompress that's for sure I don't go to many movies I also don't think the movies are very good I, can't, I have a hard time finding movies I love I've and I've seen a spate of things I I've, they all have been uh, you know uh, sold to me as great movies this season and I just I haven't they've all fallen short I've seen much better theater than I've seen movies and I'm I think that's because they're being generated by producers by people who are trying to figure out what people's tastes are instead of by screenwriters and directors getting to um, express uh, what they want and they think people should see I don't know how else to, to, to explain it well, at this point, before we open it up to questions, um, if this interview were a show, what would the write-up be? <laughs> Who wants to answer that question? <laughs> um, what, I, I, I think they Personally, would... Personally, I think it went great, but I... Thank you, but I, I think they'd say, or my, if my wife were here, she'd say, you say, um, too much. <laughs> um, and, um, but... <laughs> and, and, and I failed certain facets of the of the interview uh, because I couldn't even identify my own work um, well we can't say it's astonishing because that word is overused uh, uh, so I, I, I always I, I give myself a gentleman C that's what I would do <laughs> I give it a thumbs up oh thank you terrific round of applause for Peter Marks and now we have a couple of minutes if anyone has a question for Peter um, do we need to use the microphones Oh, that's right. So Hi, everyone. All right, so this, gent <laughs> this gentleman right here, if you could take the mic. Shouldn't one role or function of a theater critic be to either encourage or discourage people to see the play, and if not, why not? Yes. You, I, well, I, 
let me say this i don't think of myself as discouraging people from seeing a play i, th I that is it's just not I, i've been doing this long enough to know that it, there was a time when i really enjoyed writing a juicy pan that is a lot of fun and yes at the most at the most commercial level of the theater uh, i'm talking now about big budget shows that are really or star driven shows that are really about making money more than they are about artistic endeavor i think they are asking to be adjudged worthy of of your dollars or not at the level of a company like Woolly Mammoth or Signature or um, or Shakespeare or any of the nonprofit theaters that are are trying to basically bring quality entertainment and artistic value to you. I don't think the job is to discourage you, but it's to share with you my disappointment if I don't feel it measures up to what it should be. So I like to think of it that way. I don't like to think of it as telling you to save your money i think that's your decision i just i it, it's i do think you know I'm, i struggle with this and i that's why i'm being a little bit vague uh this idea of us as a consumer advocate for you and yes the the, the costs of these productions are huge but i can't i can't go into a theater and say you know this is a hundred dollars this is really worth fifty dollars this show it's not worth a hundred dollars you know and that and that's what it becomes sort of you you really have to keep it you have to you have to keep the experience of reviewing as a conversation between you and what's going on on that stage that's that's where it's happening and yes you're sharing it with readers it's not the other thing i'll say about reviewing is it's really not for the people in the shows i i completely endorse the idea that actors and directors not read reviews unless they're looking for guidance in some specific way for how something might evolve a new work but other than that i think it's you know it's a conversation between readers and and the person who's seen the show first another question uh, right here uh, or i'm sorry sorry, sorry. um Many times when a play opens, I will look for your review, and then I don't see it sometimes. And I wonder, how many plays do you review a month, and how much input do you have on what you want to um, review? review. Uh, so when you're saying you see my, you'll see a review by somebody else, is that what you're saying? Uh, thank you. Uh, the 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 answer to that is uh, is uh, is I get to decide. I'm the chief critic, I get to decide what I want to see. And I try and vary it, but it's becoming harder to see everything, not so much because there's so much stuff to do, but because I'm being asked to do more of other kinds of writing. I'm being asked to write more features, more advanced pieces, I'm being asked to blog, which is there's this thing called the style blog, and they want a digital presence for their writers, um, because it's important to be on each platform and these things take time away from being a th in the theater and I find that I just don't, I don't have the uh, I mean there were times when I was seeing four and five plays a week and writing about it and it's you know nobody was ever meant to be that entertained in life you know it really, it's too much and you really your, your, your brain after the fourth show your nerve endings are frayed so in a given year I'll probably see 125 plays and that's low. That's about that's one every that's one every three days. That's about what it ends up being, and that's even. And I would say there were years when there were more. And I don't even review all of the plays I see. I often see things that I don't review, as in, in addition. So that's yeah. So that's it's a lot of theater, but that's a good thing because there's a lot of theater to see. I mean, there's tons and tons of theater to see. Companies. Yeah. In the DC area. Yeah. 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 It's incredible. Amazing. amazing. It's amazing. Let's go to the side of the room. Um, so right here. No, I think the, the issue of building young audiences is really important in the arts. And everyone's, all the arts are facing it. And there's a lot of debate and a lot of conversation about it. Um, I think that you hit on part of the point is that um, education, we've cut a lot of it. 
out of schools and, and education has kind of cut back on um, dealing with it. And I think it's one of the things that we need to get a refocus on. But one of the specific question with that as a backdrop, you mentioned, which I think was an important part, is it's the plays, sometimes it's the plays that don't resonate also. Are there some specific plays that you think in, in recent times that you could talk about or just mention that you think were really good for young audiences and the kind of things that we should be looking for more of? Uh, one comes immediately to mind was a play called Really Really at Signature Theater, uh, which was about the, the generation, the, the me generation. It was really looking it, with a fa fairly jaundiced view uh, uh, by a young playwright at his own generation. And it attracted a lot of young people who wanted to see themselves, or even if it wasn't the most flattering portrait of themselves on stage, they went. I think, and that was, that was one, for example. Uh, I'm trying to think of like non, you know, it's, it's easiest at the musical theater level. Um, uh, I think that the production of If Then that was here uh, was widely seen by a range of audiences in Washington, even though it was a little more expensive. I saw a lot of young people there because uh, the playwright, first of all, it was the, do you know what If Then was? It was this tr musical that tried out with Dina Menzel by the creators of Next to Normal, which also had an important stop, stop at Arena Stage before it went to Broadway. Um, they're, a, they're, they're, a, a, they're a songwriting team that speak to younger people. And, and again, uh, I saw lots of young people at that show. So it, it doesn't, it, it, it's, I think it's hardest, it is hard in the classics. I, I have found that, um, that even in with my students, it was oh, getting them because of the language mostly. The, the the barrier of language is a is a high one, and getting them to to relax into that makes it hard. And it's vital. I mean, that's vital that we. How do we add that to our education and push more, get more emphasis on that, so that then ex do. I think the music in the, in the classroom, totally. Hurting just because we're taking that out of schools. And I think the theaters and the schools have a responsibility to begin to put more emphasis on education to get more people. If, if we want to build this audience, otherwise we're going to wake up and it's going to age out and there really will be uh, more empty seats than we need. I agree, totally. We have time for a couple more. Yes, right there. And the flowered leopard. Lovely print. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi. So um, the National Theatre of London is currently doing live in HD broadcasts at Shakespeare. And uh, we know that the Met has a successful program of live in HD in movie theaters. And Broadway has been trying to break into this category. And um, touring shows and shows that are in New York that are not on tour with Broadway stars. Um, I'm just curious about how do you feel about that? You know, the price point for those tickets are $20. It's a live viewing. You're in a movie theater setting where you're not in a reserved seat necessarily, which is so, you know, important to a Broadway consumer. Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on Broadway in HD live on screen at, at your Cineplex. I'm just curious, how many people have been to an, a live performance of either Shakespeare or the National Theater, any of these that have, uh, these sort of pl play, plays on, 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 on the big screen? And how many of those people have found that a satisfying experience? Yes. Yes. A different, a different experience. Having seen the play in London and then seen it again, yes. it's quite, you, you get the close-ups of the faces, and it's a very different so you've actually seen a play that you've saw on yeah. stage yeah. on screen. Yeah. You saw the Othello. Yeah. That's a great production. Um, I think it's probably got limited. It, it 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 seems like it's an add-on for these companies, and it's been very successful for the National Theater. It's been hugely successful. They're 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 burgeoning. I mean, I I don't. You know, from just speaking personally, it doesn't translate for me. It's not what I go to the theater for. Uh, I go for that visceral connection of being in the room with these people. It's, I can't replicate it uh, on a screen. 
I think they do much better than the ones when I was a kid. There was a whole series, I don't know if you all remember, this American Film Theater in the 70s, some of you may, uh, when they did all these plays, they put like, I remember Lost in the Stars. I mean, it was the, they, were, they, were, they were sort of classics and semi-classics that they put on the screen, and it was deadly, and I, it, it stayed with me. That, that memory you know, of, it, of it being sort of like you know, unbearable to watch makes it hard for me to make the leap. So, um, but I agree that having seen that Othello in London, I'd love to see it again on screen. So I, I don't want to... I don't want to say that it's 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 not useful. I don't think it's the future for the theater. Um, I think it's a it's a way to sort of. Is that an access point? Is that an entry point for those for the young again, for the young who can't afford? Maybe. maybe. So the question was: Is maybe. it an entry point for young people? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe, maybe for some. I mean, you know, you know, if you offer a multiplicity of entry points, it's gonna some of them are gonna connect. It's with different groups of people. Uh, but I don't, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that, that it's having that kind of impact in a, you know. I think they did an HD live of like, or an HD production of Memphis, the musical. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it did very well. It did well. Yeah. It's different. So one, one last question. One last Maybe question. from a se section we haven't been to. All right. Um, in the blue shirt. In the blue shirt. Okay. So I'm just going to run in front of everybody and give it to you. I'm just curious. You mentioned that the Washington Theater is flourishing against sort of a trend of, of what you want to explain that or why you think that's happened? It, yeah. Well, thank God for my own, um, my own benefit, uh, uh, frankly. But uh, I think there are pockets of this country where theater thrives for very local reasons. And for Washington, one of them is it's a highly educated community. Uh, it's got the highest percentage of PhDs in the country. I mean, you actually do see Supreme Court justices come to the theater uh, in Washington, which is inc incredibly encouraging. I think that's part of the reason that there's just a, and I think that there's, um, aside from federal Washington, there's a very strong sense of community in this region. I know it's the, we hear it's a transient place, but a lot of people come here um, and then participate in the culture from wherever else they came. They bring that here and, they, and it, strengthen, it strengthens the local theater going habit for a lot of people. So I, I think that those, that that plays a part and also institutionally washington is is a, is almost unique um in the in the number of large theaters it has that are supported not by corporate sponsors or but by by philanthropists by individual philanthropists who have you know people like the late jay lee mead who you know helped in create washington theater um the kogods or another family that have done this. There's a very strong financial infrastructure of support that has, uh, you know, I don't know that you could name a city, maybe Chicago, even Chicago doesn't have a Shakespeare, th I mean, the, 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 the sort of the six or seven companies plus the Kennedy Center that form sort of the, the core of Washington theater going, I'm not even, you know, you have Steppenwolf and the Goodman and then a, a satellite of smaller companies, maybe Chicago Shakespeare, and, but not six or seven that have this kind of, this, this, this competitive, not competitive, I don't want to say they're competitive, but they're, they're, all, they're all artistically ambitious in, 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 in the same and different ways. I think that is unusual um, in the country outside of New York City, which is an aberration, basically. Oh. Minneapolis too, but I again, yes, you've got the Guthrie and Minneapolis. Uh, you've got the Jun Lun. I mean, yes, it is. That's true. The model is closer to to to, to what you might see there. But the, but very, you know, there's a handful of cities where that's true. But according to Theater Washington, who does the Helen Hayes Awards, we have the largest number of theaters in the country next to New York. And again, New York is kind of its own beast, which I say makes us number one. <laughs> um, and with that, um, again, I'd like to give Peter a big round of applause. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. And thank you to you.